And also, before we turn to questions, uh, may I invite the First Minister just to update the Chamber on uh, the, recent, the Government's response to the weather situation? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for this opportunity to provide the Chamber with a brief update on the weather impacts being experienced across the country. Uh, firstly, I want to take the opportunity to thank all those working in our emergency and essential services, on our transport network, volunteers and the general public for their commitment and forbearance over the past couple of days in the face of very extreme weather conditions. Many, including many members of the public, have and continue to go the extra mile to help those in need and I am very grateful to them for that. Of course, very difficult situations have been encountered by many, not least those who were stranded in their vehicles yesterday evening and in some cases overnight and into this morning on the M80. I can advise the Chamber that the situation on the M80 is improving, uh, but work continues, particularly on the southbound carriageway, to clear the backlog of traffic and get the road open again, uh, but only, of course, when it is safe to do so. There have been very extensive efforts overnight involving local authorities, police, the fire service, mountain rescue and volunteers to ensure the welfare of those who have been stuck in their vehicles. The Scottish Government Resilience Committee has been meeting regularly and we will continue to do so. One issue of particular attention for us today is support for health boards, where understandably many members of staff are facing real challenges getting to work. Although the red weather warning came to an end at 10 a.m. today, a high-impact amber weather warning remains in place for most of the country. That means the advice today for the general public remains do not travel unless it is unavoidable. In the last couple of hours, the Met Office has extended that amber warning through to 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. And let me, presiding officer, be very clear what that means. While everything possible will be done to keep roads clear and open, if you do travel during this period, you do face significant risk of encountering blocked roads and possibly becoming stranded. Uh, given that the amber warning with the associated do not uh, travel advice has now been extended through tomorrow morning's rush hour, I can also advise the Chamber that the Scottish Government will be continuing our engagement with business organisations and I would take uh, the opportunity again to urge employers to be flexible and to put the safety of their staff first at all times. Uh, also, presiding officer, while temperatures remain low and conditions remain difficult, I would encourage everyone who can to check on elderly neighbours and keep an eye out for anyone who may be vulnerable or need help. Details of organisations who stand ready to provide help and shelter to anyone who is homeless have been widely circulated. Uh, Presiding officer, let me end where I started by thanking sincerely all those working hard to keep people safe. Conditions like those we are experiencing now uh, make a level of disruption and inconvenience inevitable. I think everybody understands that, though many, many people across the country are working hard to minimise that disruption and inconvenience. However, the priority is and will continue to be public safety at all times. So my message to the public is to please heed the weather and travel warnings that are issued for your safety and to follow advice from the police, from Transport Scotland and from your local council. Uh, I will now, of course, be happy to answer any questions during First Minister's questions. Thank you very much. And we turn to the first question, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me take up one of my questions on the weather that we're facing today. We've seen bus drivers, Red Cross workers and emergency services once again rise to the challenge and everyone across Scotland thanks them for their fortitude and in many cases bravery. The advice remains not to travel and I join the First Minister in urging everybody to heed that advice, including, I'm sad to say, Scottish Conservative activists preparing for a party conference. It's now off. Um, but can I ask the First Minister to reassure the country that every possible resource available to agencies will be put to effective use to try to return our transport system to normal as soon as possible over the coming few days. First Minister. Uh, well, can I thank Ruth Davidson for that question and uh, perhaps also put in record uh, my thanks to the Conservative Party for the responsibility that has been shown uh, around the arrangements for uh, their party conference. Um, I, I can give the assurance that every possible resource will be brought to bear to ensure that we 
are keeping the country moving as far as we can, uh, given the travel warnings that are in place, uh, but also ensuring that there is a recovery as quickly as possible once those uh, warnings are, are lifted. If I can give some context, there are uh, around the country uh, right now more than uh, 200 trunk road winter vehicles that are available for spreading salt and ploughing snow. Uh, that's typically one spreader for every uh, 16 kilometres of trunk road. There are currently over 360,000 tonnes of salt available to treat the trunk roads. Uh, all available resources uh, last night and into this morning on the M8 uh, have been made available. Uh, that consisted of five spreaders and a multi-purpose vehicle. So all uh, resources are being brought to bear. We continue uh, to coordinate the response through the Scottish Government's Resilience Unit. As I indicated in my remarks a few moments ago, uh, we're paying particular attention today to some of the difficulties being experienced by health boards, including, uh, for example, by Edinburgh Royal Infirmary uh, in this city. It is understandable uh, that some members of uh, our healthcare staff will struggle to get to work. So that is why particular focus has been paid to that today. Uh, there are a whole range of impacts of weather such as this. Um, and it's not just government and uh, agencies working with government that respond. Members of the public uh, have been uh, responding extremely well. And again, I would put uh, on record my thanks to everybody who has done so. Ruth Davison. Thank you. Uh, Presiding officer, yesterday the First Minister unveiled her plan to boost the Scottish economy with a new Scottish National Investment Bank. Of course, that's a different thing to the existing Scottish Investment Bank, which is also different to the proposed Business Development Bank, and of course shouldn't be confused with the SME Holding Fund or the Capital Acceleration Programme, or indeed the half billion pound Scottish growth scheme, which has barely released a penny. Can I ask the First Minister, does this sound like joined up investment to her? First Minister. Well, actually, uh, I agree with Ruth Davidson uh, on the fact that the investment bank, that the implementation uh, plan for which was uh, published yesterday, is very different to any of these schemes she has spoken about. And that is because uh, we believe uh, that we need to uh, provide uh, something and uh, an ability to intervene on a scale and of a nature that's different to what has gone before. Of course, if Ruth Davidson, as I assume she will have, uh, read uh, Benny Higgins' implementation report closely, she will see that once the investment bank is up and running, it is the intention uh, for things like the SME Holding Fund, the, the current Scottish Investment Bank that is under the aegis of Scottish Enterprise to come under the umbrella of the investment bank. So uh, we will, uh, of course, once we have the opportunity to consider Benny Higgins' report in detail and respond, I indicated yesterday we will respond formally in May, although we've given early indications of our support for some of the recommendations. Uh, Keith Brown will, of course, come to the chamber, uh, and I, I would hope there would be a full uh, debate around the detail of that in the chamber. But uh, I guess my final point would be this. I, I would hope everybody across the chamber would welcome this initiative. We frequently uh, and rightly have debates in this chamber about the economy. As I frequently say, the fundamentals of the Scottish economy are strong, but we know the challenges we face. And people from right across the spectrum, from those working in the financial services, sector uh, to a, a whole range of different interests. Uh, Friends of the Earth, for example, have recognised the potential for a, an investment bank of this nature to be truly transformational. And I would hope that is something that would incite, enthuse uh, and get the support of everybody in this chamber. Ruth Davison. The First Minister says that this is a model of clarity, but nobody seems to have told her office because when we made a freedom of information request asking for details of the new investment back, they wrote back asking which one we were talking about. <laughs> so we replied that it's the same one that you announced in 2009, that you re-announced in 2013, that you announced again in 2015, and the one that John Swinney said you shouldn't do after all in 2016. First Minister, even your office didn't seem to know the difference between the Scottish Investment Bank and the Scottish National Investment Bank, so how can the public? First Minister. I would have thought even Ruth Davidson would, would have risen to the challenge of seeing the opportunity uh, that is now uh, presented. Of course we have... Well, let me make two points. Of course, as I said in uh, my earlier answer, there is uh, an organisation that sits within Scottish Enterprise uh, called the Scottish Investment Bank. Uh, we want to do something now on a different scale and of a different nature. Yes, we have considered this in the past and for various reasons have decided that it wasn't the appropriate time to move forward. Uh, we have decided that now is the time and we've now done, uh, or rather more accurately, Benny Higgins has done, 
uh, an amazing amount of work in a very short period of time to get to the point we reached yesterday of the publication of the implementation plan. And I would uh, commend that plan to everybody across the chamber. Uh, those uh, who may or may not include Ruth Davidson who haven't actually read the implementation plan yet to do so. And uh, you will see uh, the detail of the work that's been done. What, what I thought was impressive about Benny Higgins' work published yesterday was that it A, set out uh, the vision for what an investment bank can achieve, but also a lot of the detailed work that is now required to make that a reality. I set out the government's intention now to move at pace. Uh, formally establishing a, a national investment bank will require legislation in this parliament, uh, but pending that legislation, uh, we want to get that bank operating in shadow form during 2019. So there'll be a lot of debate around the detail of this, but in terms uh, of the aim and the objective and the principle, I hope even Ruth Davidson will get to a point where she can be excited and enthused by the potential it offers. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, despite the farcical response from the First Minister's office, there is a, a serious point here because after 10 years in power and nine years since they first proposed an investment bank, all of these re-announcements have led us nowhere. And while I don't want to bury the First Minister under an avalanche of statistics, here goes. The SNP told us in 2010 that they would increase exports by 50%. And they failed. Their own figures show that they are running short by the small matter of £27 billion. That is the price of an SNP that's keen to get the headlines for launches and relaunches, but forgets to even start to build the actual bank until nine years later. After such a litany of failure, why should we believe that yesterday's announcement should be any different? Yeah. First Minister. Well, I, I'm sorry to, uh, to bury Ruth Davidson in an aval avalanche of statistics, but here goes. Uh, Scotland's international exports, excluding oil and gas, increased by £460 million to just short of £30 billion in 2016. Overall, Scotland's international exports are up between 2007 and 2016 by £40 5%. Uh, Scottish whisky exports uh, were valued at 4.36 billion, up 9% compared to uh, 2016. So that paints rather a different picture from the one Ruth Davidson uh, was trying to paint. But you know, we have, as uh, Ruth Davidson I think has actually uh, shown in her questioning, we've had a range of interve interventions to provide financing for businesses to help them innovate, to help them export more. Uh, they have had some successes, but we look at the challenges facing our economy uh, now, the need to catch up with the productivity levels uh, of other European countries and the way we have closed the gap with the rest of the UK, uh, the need to grow the economy faster, and of course the need to prepare for the impact of Brexit that's been imposed by Ruth Davidson's uh, party on the Scottish economy. And we think the time is right now uh, to do that partly through the establishment of a Scottish National Investment Bank. Uh, and we've got to the stage, as we did yesterday, uh, of publishing an implementation plan. And now we're going to get on with the work of turning that into a reality. And as I say, I hope everybody across the chamber will make a contribution to making sure that happens. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding Officer, can I thank the First Minister for her statement and associate these benches with her message of support to those people uh, working uh, both night and day to get the country moving again. The uh, extreme weather has brought about uh, a, a grinding halt to Scotland's transport system. However, it's not just our road and rail networks that are affected uh, by this weather. Just last Thursday, uh, one mile away from here, a man who had been sleeping rough died in the freezing cold. He died sleeping on a discarded mattress. So it's clear that urgent action is needed to end rough sleeping. So I welcome the setting up by the government of the Rough Sleeping Action Group, which has been set the task of reducing rough sleeping this winter. So can the First Minister update us on their work and tell Parliament how the government will be measuring its impact. First Minister. Uh, yes, I can. Can I uh, firstly take the opportunity to say that uh, for as long as one single person is homeless or rough sleeping in our country, then we still have work to do. And I hope that is something that would unite 
all of us uh, across this chamber. The Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group moved very quickly, as Richard Leonard is aware, to make uh, recommendations on actions to tackle rough sleeping during this winter. Uh, all of those recommendations uh, were accepted by the Scottish Government and those recommendations are already being implemented. Uh, the Action Group is now examining longer term actions to end rough sleeping, but also to transform the use of temporary accommodation uh, and the next set of recommendations are due from the action group in the spring. As Richard Leonard uh, would also, uh, is also aware of, we've created uh, an ending homelessness fund of £50 million over the next five years to help support uh, prevention and drive sustainable uh, change. Uh, as all of us know, Scotland has some of the strongest rights for homeless people in the world, but we must make sure uh, that those rights can be exercised and everybody found to be homeless is entitled uh, to housing uh, and gets that housing um, and that is, is of huge importance. I think the importance of that while we know uh, about it and feel it at every time is underlined uh, during the extreme weather conditions that we're facing right now and as I indicated in my remarks earlier, uh, details of a range of organisations, organisations for example like Streetwork, the Bethany Christian Trust have been circulated so that anybody is aware of anybody who is homeless or uh, rough, sleeping rough uh, can contact these organisations to get help and shelter uh, for individuals concerned. Richard Leonard. Um, I welcome that answer from the First Minister because anybody walking the streets of any city across Scotland knows that it feels as if there has been a marked increase in rough sleeping. Uh, and we know that rough sleeping increased last year in Wales by 10%, in England uh, by 15%. But we simply don't know precisely how much it is increasing in Scotland, because the Scottish Government does not comprehensively measure this. In London, for example, they not only comprehensively count the number of rough sleepers, this information is systematically shared across all relevant public agencies and homelessness organisations in the city. So, First Minister, will you follow the lead of the Greater London Authority and consider establishing a combined homelessness and information network approach here in Scotland. First Minister. Um, I, I think the short answer to that question is yes, we want to uh, be in a position to learn from best practice uh, for, for, for wherever we find it. Uh, and of course, but of course, as I've already indicated, we have established the action group that are looking at exactly uh, issues of this type uh, and will make a suite of recommendations about how we better tackle homelessness and rough sleeping, but also, of course, how we better uh, gather uh, and report and share the statistics on that, because it is extremely important, as I think we would all recognise that we have an accurate picture of that. I, certainly uh, do recognise the, the anecdotal evidence and some of the statistical evidence we have suggesting an increase in rough sleeping. We all know, I think, uh, that the welfare cuts that are being introduced by the UK government are one of the driving factors of that, but we all have a responsibility uh, to work together to address that. So uh, whatever uh, other issues may divide us in this chamber, I hope this is an issue where those of us in these benches and the Labour benches would be able to find common ground and work together. And we are certainly open we are certainly open uh, to suggestions uh, such as the one Richard Leonard has just made. Richard Leonard. Uh, I'd like to thank again uh, the First Minister for uh, the tone of her response, uh, because imagine uh, facing a night on the streets in this weather, imagine being evicted last night or tonight and facing the extreme cold. The campaign group Living Rent has proposed a change in the law to ban winter evictions. In France, a version of this law runs from the 1st of November to the 31st of March each year and covers all tenants. It stops people being thrown onto the streets when temperatures drop. Such a measure would simply save lives in Scotland. My party will consider banning winter evictions as part of our housing reform policy. Will you commit your government today to doing the same? First Minister. Uh, I will commit my government to doing exactly uh, as Richard Leonard has just said there and considering uh, that uh, as a, a step we can take to help us tackle uh, what we all accept is a, a very, very serious issue. Uh, I do want to say again though, because I think it is important we establish, and I think we established with the support of 
uh, Richard Leonard and his colleagues, uh, the Homelessness Action Group, uh, which is composed of a range of experts, and ask them to specifically look at recommendations they want to make. So these will be the kinds of things that the Action Group is looking at and may well uh, form part of the recommendations they put forward. And uh, I give a commitment today uh, that we will uh, take forward the recommendations of that Action Group when they come forward in the spring, as we did their interim recommendations uh, towards the end of last year. Can I just, uh, before I, I finish this answer though, uh, because Richard Leonard uh, rightly talks about the experiences of anybody living uh, rough uh, or, or without a home in weather conditions like this. Uh, the Scottish Government social media channels has circulated details of a range of organisations that are there to help now and I would encourage all members of the Chamber uh, to use uh, their own methods of getting that information out there as widely as possible. Thank you. I have a couple of constituency supplementaries. The first from Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the challenges last summer on Sky at various sites as tourists came to see why the constituency I represent is the most beautiful in Scotland. Can the First Minister advise what the Scottish Government is doing to invest in improved infrastructure at key sites like the Fairy Pools, the Kerrang and Nice Point, to name just a few? First Minister. Well, we should be very proud that so many people choose to come to Scotland to enjoy uh, our beautiful scenery uh, and attractions, if, if not always our weather. Uh, tourism is a vital industry for Scotland and we should continue to support its growth. However, we do recognise that an increase in visitor numbers can lead to pressure on local infrastructure and that's why last year we announced the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund and I'm delighted that Fiona Hislop today announced three pilot projects for the fund including two on Sky. The Ferry Pools uh, will receive up to £300,000 to develop visitor facilities and Nice Point Lighthouse will receive £100,000 for work to improve road access and parking. Uh, these grants are uh, in addition to £300,000 of funding announced by Highland Council on Monday for road and parking improvements at both the Ferry Pools and hiking destination. Jamie Green. The First Minister will be aware that Ryanair announced this week that it will be closing its fixed base operations at Glasgow Airport. Some estimates put the job loss figure in the hundreds. Uh, this will come to a huge, uh, come as a huge blow to Glasgow, the west of Scotland, and clearly have a negative effect on Scotland's connectivity in terms of trade and tourism. So can I ask the First Minister uh, what action the Scottish Government is taking to assist those directly or indirectly affected by this decision. And whilst it is a commercial decision made by Ryanair, what lever does the SNP government have at its disposal to better support the aviation industry in Scotland, including commitments made in its own manifesto? First Minister. Well, firstly, I regret the announcement uh, made by Ryanair earlier uh, this week and the Scottish Government, as we would do in any circumstance that this will work with any employee who's affected by this announcement, although, of course, as members are aware, uh, many of the services uh, will transfer from Glasgow to Edinburgh and uh, there will be employment opportunities uh, through that. We work very hard with a, a range of airlines to improve connectivity from all of our airports and will continue to do so. Uh, of course, uh, the Scottish Government uh, wants uh, to move forward with our manifesto commitment around ADT, uh, the reasons why that has been delayed uh, in terms of the issues around the Highlands and Islands exemption have been well rehearsed in this Parliament. But I do think it's slightly rich, of course, uh, to be asked that question by a member of a party that doesn't actually support our proposal uh, on ADT. So uh, the Conservatives, of course, have said that they would support reduction of ADT on long haul flights, which is not uh, the proposal that Ryanair uh, would, uh, would want. So I would hope we can see progress on that. But if parties want to see progress on that, they actually have to support it in this chamber. Thank you. Question three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I add on behalf of the Scottish Green Party our thanks to those who are keeping Scotland safe, uh, who are working to make sure that our transport infrastructure, our emergency services and services throughout our communities uh, are responding to the current weather situation. The, the First Minister uh, also said in, in making those remarks that, res that employers have serious responsibilities not to put pressure on people to travel unsafely. Uh, does the First Minister agree that that pressure is not only coming from those who are asking people to go to work, but also no employee should be in a position of choosing whether to travel unsafely or lose pay by staying at home and staying safe. Given the prevalence now uh, of casualised work, zero hours contracts and the gig economy, does the First Minister agree that no employer should put an employee in the position 
of losing pay in order to stay safe? First Minister. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I very strongly uh, agree with that uh, and I would take this opportunity uh, as I did earlier on to encourage employers to urge employers uh, indeed and call on employers to be flexible uh, and above all else to make sure that they are putting the safety of their workers uh, first and above anything else. Uh, I think it's really important to point out not just for the benefit of employers but per perhaps for the general public more uh, more widely when uh, whether warnings red or amber are, are issued as they have been in recent days these are not warnings just <coughs> issued uh, for the sake of convenience these are warnings issued for the sake of the safety uh, of the public and in particular the traveling public and all of us have a responsibility to make sure uh, we do what we can to ensure that these warnings are heeded and that very definitely includes employers of course there are uh, parts of the workforce, and I, I would mention the health workforce in particular, uh, who we do uh, want to support to get to work, and we, they, they experience the, the same challenges as anybody else. There are lots of people across the country right now, health boards and volunteers, uh, deploying four by four vehicles, for example, to get nurses and doctors and other healthcare workers uh, into uh, hospitals and, and health centres. But generally, employers uh, must make sure that they are acting in a way that prioritises the safety of their staff at all times. And again, I hope that's a message that goes out loudly and clearly today. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful for those comments. And as on previous similar situations, I hope very much that public sector employee, employers will be exemplary in their treatment, not only of directly employed staff, but agency and contractor staff as well. Uh, for my second question, though, can I turn to the issues we'll be discussing later uh, around the Continuity Bill? We believe that the introduction of the Continuity Bill, the alternative Brexit Bill that the Scottish Government is bringing to this Parliament, is a necessary response to the Brexit crisis. But one of the criticisms that the SNP have rightly levelled at the UK Government is their inflexibility and their unwillingness to amend the UK legislation. So can the First Minister give the Chamber an assurance that when opposition members come to propose changes to the Scottish legislation, if we wish to improve it, strengthen the scrutiny and the accountability of it, the Government will work with members proposing those amendments rather than against them? First Minister. I'm very happy to give that assurance. Uh, as Patrick Harvey knows, uh, following uh, the session of First Minister's questions, Parliament will debate uh, the, the timetable for the continuity bill, so I, I don't want to preempt the discussion that will be had then. Clearly, we're not uh, in control of the overall timetable for Brexit, and we have to uh, act in a way that allows us to protect the interests of Parliament, hence the proposed emergency timetable for this bill. Uh, but even within that emergency timetable, we do want to work with others across Parliament uh, to listen to concerns and suggestions for how that bill uh, can be improved if it needs to be improved. So I'm, I'm very happy to give that open assurance. Let me finally on this issue say uh, and, and repeat really the fact that we have introduced this continuity bill this week uh, is something we require to do to protect the interests of Parliament. It, it does not mean we have given up on seeking an agreement with the UK government. We will continue uh, to do that but at the heart of these discussions with the UK government is an important principle uh, and that principle is this. Do we allow a situation where UK governments can uh, impose uh, situations on this parliament in devolved matters or do we insist that in devolved matters it, that can't be done without the consent of this parliament and that's a really important issue of principle uh, and this government will not recommend to parliament uh, consent for any legislation that undermines uh, the fundamental basis of devolution in that way. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, can I thank uh, the workers who are operating in these extreme weather conditions and I'm sure everyone here is grateful for their efforts. Uh, university lecturers are on strike. Lecturers are not well paid and it's surely not fair that their pensions would be cut by £10,000 a year with the proposed changes. It has been suggested that the UK and Scottish government should step in to underwrite the scheme and to protect the pensions. Scottish universities are the responsibility of the Scottish Government. So will the First Minister agree to this proposal to underwrite the scheme to stop this strike and protect the pensions of university staff? First Minister. Well, 
firstly, as, as I'm sure Willie Rennie uh, is aware, um, universities are autonomous institutions. Uh, it is not possible for the Scottish Government to dictate to them uh, in terms of issues like this, or, or, although we can and we very often do encourage them uh, to act in particular ways. Uh, this particular pension scheme is also not a Scottish Government funded uh, pension scheme. And I think those two points are very important uh, to put on the record uh, here today. All of that said, uh, I do absolutely uh, understand the position that university lecturers and, and, and staff are, are taking, and I uh, sympathise with that position. Uh, we have, uh, I, I, I understand that Shirley Ann Somerville has written to university uh, principals. We will continue to encourage dialogue and settlement of these issues in order uh, that those working in our universities and doing such a good job in our universities are treated fairly as they have a right to expect. Willie Rennie. First Minister, uh, for that answer, and I understand the points that she makes, but the Scottish Government already backs the pensions of post-1992 universities, so this would not be an unusual step. We have got world-class universities here. They're worth £7 billion to our economy and drive innovation and research. Yet our universities are already under pressure with Brexit, which threatens our ability to attract world-class staff from overseas. By underwriting their pensions, the Scottish Government, working together with the UK Government, can retain and attract the best Scottish and overseas staff. That's why I think we need to take action now on the pensions. I would encourage the First Minister to start work on this. There are 14 days of strike. It's a hit of £10,000 to pensions each year. I think it's important. I'm sure she does as well. So will she take up this idea and start the negotiations? First Minister. Well, you look, in the interest of consensus, of, of course, I will consider the points that Willie Rennie uh, has made and, and we will discuss uh, where relevant and where we think appropriate any issue like this with the UK government. But I think there's a really important point I want to make here. This is a responsibility of universities uh, to resolve and I would expect to see universities resolve it. We have just passed a budget in this parliament which gives universities a real terms increase in their budget. Uh, as uh, Willie Rennie has said uh, universities are responsible for setting the salaries of their principals, for example. So this is something that we uh, should expect our universities to resolve in the interests of the staff uh, who work for them. The Scottish Government will continue to take a close interest uh, in this uh, and encourage dialogue that will lead to resolution. Uh, of course, I will consider any points that are raised with me in the chamber, including the ones Willie Rennie has just made. But don't let any of us in this chamber uh, miss that central point that we should be looking to universities uh, to resolve this issue. And some further supplementaries. The first from Monica Lennon. Thank you. The First Minister has already given a very helpful um, statement on the adverse weather and also in response to Patrick Harvey's question. Um, on the M80 in my region, there were tailbacks of up to eight miles and at one point around 1,000 vehicles in below freezing conditions. The Transport Minister, Hamza Youssef, was, was on TV last night, highlighting in particular the responsibility of hauliers because there were hundreds of lorries uh, causing a lot of these problems. We've heard today about the responsibility that employers have, but apart from a, a, a message to be flexible, what particular conversations uh, is the Transport Minister having with industry to make sure that people are being kept safe and people are not taking unnecessary risks? Well, can I, can I thank Monica Lennon because she actually raises a, a really important issue. I, I'm going to be quite blunt here. I, um, as members would expect, was paying very close attention uh, to the, the live cameras uh, on the M80 uh, over the course of yesterday afternoon into yesterday evening. And, and if I can be absolutely frank, there were far more HGVs on that road than there should have been when a red warning was in place. And I do think we have to be very clear uh, in the message we are sending to companies uh, who, who deliver goods uh, with HGVs, and this is not a criticism of drivers because driver safety is one of the important issues here. Uh, during a red weather warning, an HGV should not be uh, on one of our trunk roads unless it is absolutely unavoidable. And I uh, saw some uh, branded HGVs uh, in, in pictures uh, yesterday, uh, and given the branding on them, I would struggle to say that their uh, transport was unavoidable. So that is a message I think should go out very strongly from this chamber to companies who use HGVs during weather conditions like this. Ross Greer. 
thank you. This week marks the first anniversary of a majority of MSPs from across all parties pledging our support to the Thai campaign. The longer we wait to address this issue, the longer LGBTI young people who do not attend trailblazing schools such as Dumbarton or Vale of Leven academies in my region have to experience education and school environments which are not inclusive, do not recognise their identity and give way to bullying, harassment and worse. Will the government commit to implementing the recommendations being worked up by the LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group at the earliest possible opportunity? First Minister. Well, I've uh, in this chamber before expressed my support for the Thai campaign uh, and the objectives of, of that campaign and do so again today. Uh, in a sense, the, the answer was included in the latter part of Ross Greer's uh, question to me. There is a working group right now which includes the Thai campaign, which will come forward in due course uh, with conclusions and recommendations. The Scottish Government certainly looks forward to receiving them uh, and looks forward to taking them forward. And Ash Denham. To ask the First Minister what the next steps are for negotiations on the EU withdrawal bill and if she's hopeful at this stage for a resolution that respects devolution across the UK. First Minister. Well, as I indicated to Patrick Harvey, we continue to seek agreement with the UK Government. There will be further uh, discussions next week. Uh, there will be... Uh, I think uh, a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee in plenary session uh, round about mid-March, I think the 14th of, of March to be uh, precise. I hope we can reach agreement, but I think it's really important that people understand the issue at stake here. Uh, I've heard it described as, as being a very uh, short distance between uh, the two governments, and in one way of looking at it, that may be true, but there is a really important issue of principle. This is not one of these situations where we've both got our positions and we can have meet in the middle uh, in some vague way. This is a fundamental issue of principle. The uh, latest proposal from the UK government would uh, involve uh, consultation uh, with the Scottish Parliament and other devolved administrations around issues that are part of our responsibility. I don't think consultation is enough. I think it should be the consent of the Scottish Parliament that is required. Uh, so I hope the UK government uh, will finally agree to abiding by that principle. If they do, then we will have agreement. The continuity bill can be withdrawn and we can uh, hopefully get into a position where we recommend consent of the withdrawal bill. Uh, but I hope all members uh, across parties in this chamber would recognise that no government, no first minister worth their salt could recommend uh, to a Scottish Parliament that it approved legislation that undermine uh, the basic principles upon which our Parliament is founded. Question number five, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. To ask the First Minister what progress has been made on the creation of a Scottish National Investment Bank. First Minister. Well, yesterday I was delighted to attend the launch of the Scottish National Investment Bank implementation plan, a copy of which is winging its way to Ruth Davidson uh, as, we, as we speak. Uh, developed by Benny Higgins, the CEO of Tesco Bank, with the support of an advisory group, the plan contains recommendations for Scottish ministers that cover the remit, the governance, the operating model and the financing of the new bank. The significant milestone brings us one step closer to establishing a publicly owned Scottish National Investment Bank and I very much look forward to doing so. Ivan McKee. I thank the First Minister for the answer and it's clear to those of us who understand the investment landscape and the need for patient finance. That the scope and scale of the Scottish National Investment Bank means it fulfills a very different need from that met by Scottish Enterprises' current investment support activities. Can I ask the First Minister what types of businesses will be supported by the National Investment Bank, in particular how small, innovative businesses, such as those in my Glasgow province constituency, may benefit? First Minister. Well, can I thank Ivan McKee for uh, that question. Um, as the implementa implementation plan recommends, this bank will be very much mission driven. It will not be sector specific, but it will be designed to be transformational in the Scottish economy and to help us uh, address some of the big societal challenges we face. For example, the transition to a low carbon economy. And I know there are many uh, companies, small and medium sized companies, including no doubt in Ivan McKee's constituency, who will benefit from this. Uh, the recommendations are that the bank will be publicly owned, although it will uh, operate independently within a strategic framework set uh, by uh, government. It will, as I say, be mission driven, uh, operate ethically, and the recommendation is for it to have a capitalisation over the first 10 years of at least £2 billion. Now, uh, we've already 
uh, given I gave yesterday our uh, acceptance of some of these key recommendations, there are other points of detail that require closer scrutiny. We will now do that and we will uh, formally respond to Benny Higgins' report in May, at which point I hope Parliament has a full debate on the issue. Question number six, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to train and recruit more nurses. First Minister. Uh, we've committed to training an additional 2,600 uh, nurses by the end of this Parliament. On the 31st of January, we announced a 10.8% increase in intakes to pre-registration nursing and midwifery programmes for 2018-19, which is an extra 364 places. This is a sixth uh, successive rise and equates to 3,724 entry places in total for the year. Uh, in contrast to the at Westminster Government, we've retained bursaries and free tuition for nursing and midwifery students. Both, of course, were scrapped in England, and the number of English applicants to nursing course courses has plummeted by 23% as a result. Uh, we're extending and increasing successful initiatives which bring former nurses and midwives back into practice as well, and today almost 450 former registrants have taken up this opportunity to retrain, which exceeds our initial target. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Presiding officer, may I firstly pay tribute to the frontline workers battling through the adverse weather conditions today to keep our services open across Scotland. NHS recruitment issues began long before Brexit, despite what the First Minister would like to believe. Between 2009 and 2012, the number of training places for nurses and midwives was slashed by more than 20%. As a knock-on effect, vacancies have increased by 600 in 2011 to nearly 3,000 at the end of last year. When will the SNP government accept they are responsible for this crisis and implement adequate workforce planning? First Minister. Well, of course, uh, staffing challenges uh, existed before Brexit. There is no doubt whatsoever, though, that they have been hugely exacerbated by Brexit. Uh, but it's because uh, we have been aware of the need to support staffing in our NHS that we have taken action to get us to a stage we're at now where NHS staffing uh, is at a record high, uh, a 9.8% increase uh, from September 2006. Qualified nurses and midwives up by more than 5%. Uh, as I said in my initial answer, we're training more uh, nurses and have set a target by the end of this parliament. We've just announced an almost 11% increase in intakes uh, and we're doing a range of uh, other things to make sure we get nurses and midwives into our health service. But I, I do think it kind of beggars belief for a member of the Tory party when in England uh, that same party has abolished bursaries and is presiding over uh, a reduction of 23% in applicants to nursing courses uh, to stand up in this chamber and lecture anybody else. Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest to ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government can take to ensure we retain EU national nurses after Brexit who currently staff our hospitals and community services and to assure them that they are very welcome in Scotland's NHS. First Minister. Well, we greatly value the contribution that EU migrants make to our NHS and to our economy and society more generally. Uh, that's, for example, why we announced last year that the Scottish Government will pay a settled status fee for any EU citizen uh, working in the public sector in Scotland. Uh, and that will help us keep vital workers in the NHS and public services and will send, hopefully, a clear message to EU nationals that we do welcome them, uh, value them and want them to stay here. Of course, longer term, uh, I think the case now for uh, this Parliament to have flexibility over uh, migration policy is overwhelming and compelling. And that's a case that I hope we will see made right across this chamber and broader society as well. And the last hour. Thank others and thanking all our NHS, Social Security and other emergency service personnel who are continuing to provide a service to our citizens at this challenging time. Uh, when Nicola Sturgeon was Health Secretary, she took the decision to cut the number of training places for nurses. The Royal College of Nursing at the time said that that was a risk to, in terms of meeting demand in our National Health Service. This week we have learned that nursing vacancies are at record levels with almost 3,000 nursing vacancies now compared to only 600 in 2011. First Minister, we have an NHS workforce that is overworked, undervalued and under-resourced and that is now impacting on patient care with one in five patients not getting their diagnostics in time and one in five patients 
not getting their treatment in time, and this includes cancer patients. Will the First Minister therefore take this opportunity to apologise to Scotland for her decision to cut nurse training places and the impact that has had on our NHS and its patients? First Minister. Well, again, I will point out that under this government, from at the time this government took office, we've seen an increase in the NHS workforce of almost 10%. Uh, the NHS workforce is now at a record high. And as I said earlier on, we will always take uh, decisions that are right in terms uh, of that workforce. That's why for six successive uh, years, we have increased uh, nurses uh, going into training and we will continue uh, to support uh, the nursing workforce and the wider health workforce in that way um, and uh, you know that uh, I think is something that everybody uh, in this chamber should uh, seek to support. And question seven, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the danger of teenagers in airship ingesting substances purporting to be the drug MDMA. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government strongly advises against the use of any illegal or unknown substances and I would urge anyone who uh, feels unwell after taking any substance to seek uh, immediate medical attention. I understand that the children Kenny Gibson is referring to were released from hospital the next day and I'm sure we all wish them a speedy recovery. Uh, Police Scotland are awaiting the results of toxicology tests to determine the exact nature of the substance that was ingested. While this incident is clearly a cause for concern, I think it's also important to point out that the 2015 Celsius survey of drug taking behaviour amongst young people shows that the vast majority of young people have never used drugs. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. She will recall that in October 2016, nine people died in Salcoats due to the ingestion of fake Valium pills. The MDMA pills that affected the six Ayrshire teenagers last weekend are believed to be red, green or brown, bearing an owl logo. I know the First Minister will join me in urging parents and everyone else to be vigilant and report any sightings of such pills to Police Scotland, which is working hard to see such drugs, prevent their use and save lives. Can the First Minister also provide details as to what further steps are being taken to combat the specific MDMA threat? First Minister. At Police Scotland are providing a public safety message via local and social media advising parents and guardians to talk to their children about the dangers of taking drugs. Educating young people in these threats is vital. For example, Ayrshire Police Division work with local young people in recovery to produce a film for use in schools which highlights the dangers of drugs, alcohol and weapon carrying. Uh, nationally, the Know the Score website and helpline ensure that all young people in Scotland have credible and accessible information and advice on drugs. So it is important that we continue to take these kinds of steps to uh, make sure that young people have the education and the information that they need. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier on, while incidents like the one Kenny Gibson has raised are hugely concerning, uh, we must also point to the fact that the vast majority of young people do not take drugs and do not ever take drugs. Uh, and the focus of all of the work we do should be to ensure that that continues to be the case. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. And uh, following the uh, change of business motion earlier this morning, we're now going to move on to consideration of motion number 10735 in the name of Michael Russell to treat the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill as an emergency bill. Can I ask all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now?